The longer we go from the time we stop eating at night to the time we start eating the next day impacts our ability to make energy properly. Probably the perfect window of eating is probably about a six hour eating window. What does that mean? You have break fast at noon or one o'clock in the afternoon, and then you finish dinner at six or seven o'clock at night. That sounds intimidating. So okay. what is the energy paradox? The subtitle is when your get up and go has got up and gone. And the problem is we consume huge amounts of energy producing foods. Right. In fact, the, you're, we're chewing on an energy bar, you know, five every three or four hours to get more energy. And the paradox is part of the problem is those energy producing foods actually sap our energy. Mm. And that's, that's the other kind of piece of the book. Um, back when our grandparents were living, it sounds trite, but they ate whole foods. And believe it or not, they ate whole foods whole. Um, they would have a you know, sweet potato and it would be whole they did not have a sweet potato uh, potato chip. Right. They, if they were going to eat cassava, they ate cassava whole, baked. They didn't have cassava tortillas. Um, if they were going to have some protein, well, they'd have an egg or they'd have a piece of beef uh, or they'd have a piece of chicken, but they couldn't conceive of, well, I'm going to have a a whey protein isolate bar. And that's my source of protein. Now, why is that important? Because when you eat whole foods, it takes a really long time to break this food down into sugars, uh, amino acids from protein and free fatty acids from fat. And it's a long process. And as I talk about in the book, what happens normally is sugars get broken down first, and those arrive at our mitochondria to produce energy, and we're just fine, mitochondria work. Then a few hours later, the proteins are broken down, and then amino acids arrive at the mitochondria. The mitochondria are done with the sugars, the glucose, and they go, okay, good. Uh, now we got these you know, uh, amino acids to process into energy. And then several hours down the line, the fats arrive. And okay, now it's time to work on the fats. What happens now is that 60 to 80% of all the food we eat is processed and ultra processed. So now simultaneously, when we eat that energy bar, or we eat fast food, a lot of sugar, a lot of protein that's been broken down already, and a lot of fats that have been broken down already arrive in our mitochondria, slamming into it. And it's just like, you know, I live in the Los Angeles area. It's like rush hour on the 405. And what happens with all that traffic for converging to produce energy, everything grinds to a stop. And that's why so many of us, two o'clock in the afternoon after our you know, quick meal at lunch, our fifth meal, you know, we're ready to put our head down and then we need, you know, a giant shot of, you know, triple espresso to wake up or we reach for an energy bar. And so we just continue to compound the problem. The other yeah. thing that's fascinating in our lifestyle that people are unaware, and this is work from Sasha and Panda in uh, San Diego, the average American now is eating food for 16 hours a day from literally the minute they get up to literally the time they go to sleep. And that's so atypical for what anybody ever used to do. In fact, people don't know that breakfast is a modern invention. Nobody ate breakfast until the late 1800s when the industrial revolution started. And workers, men, uh, were sent off to factories very early in the morning and there were no work breaks, there was no lunch break and they came home late at night. So the wives uh, made breakfast for the men before they left. 
because they would have to go all day uh, before they ate again. And that actually caught on and thanks to the Kellogg's Corn Flakes Company uh, in 1906, we were convinced from a massive advertising campaign that breakfast is the most important meal of the day when in fact it's the least important meal of the day. What time do you recommend, uh, or, or maybe how a better question is how long after waking do you typically recommend somebody should actually, it's time to eat? Great question. So breakfast means break fast. Right. And we now know that the longer we go from the time we stop eating at night to the time we start eating the next day impacts, believe it or not, our ability to make energy properly impacts not only our lifespan, but probably more importantly, our health span, how many years we're going to be healthy. Mm -hmm. And that's been worked out very well. In, in both human and animal studies. And probably the, the perfect window of eating is probably about a six hour eating window. What does that mean? You have break fast at uh, noon or one o'clock in the afternoon, and then you finish dinner at six or seven o'clock at night. And you can move those windows. You wanna have break fast at 10. Okay, you finish dinner at four, for instance. And the book actually goes through, okay, that sounds intimidating. And it is for most people. Uh, we take you, we hold your hand and we start you just changing one hour a day each week for six weeks to get mm -hmm. to that. And then it becomes really easy. Uh, most people who've read my books know that I'm now entering my 22nd year of from January through June every year, uh, I eat all my calories in a two hour window from four to six o'clock at night. And so 22 out of 24 hours I'm fasting and busy clinical practice, see patients all day mm -hmm. long. Don't get hungry. Don't get tired. My, don't, my brain doesn't stop functioning. And it's, it's actually proven in animal studies to be pretty smart. Why, why only six, six months of the year then? I'm glad you asked me that question. Um, somebody else challenged me. So this year, I actually started in September uh, doing this. But why? Because it turns out if you follow hunter-gatherers or you follow ancient humans, which was my research in college, uh, great apes only gain weight in the summer and fall during fruit season. And they put on weight by eating fruit. Wait, and sorry, who, do, who gains weight? Great apes, so oh, great apes. Okay, gorillas, yeah. chimpanzees, orangutans, yeah, yeah. gibbons, they only gain weight during fruit season. And we actually carry their same gene that makes us store fat whenever we eat fructose, fruit mm -hmm. And then they do that because the winter is either a dry season, a cold season, or a rainy season, and there's not much food. So when I first did this starting 22 years ago, I said, hey, uh, I, I ought to follow my evolutionary design. So I, I purposely tend to gain weight in the summer and fall. And then mm. I go back to not eating much during the winter and the weight comes off during the winter. And it's kind of fun. This, this year, I went to Europe a lot this summer and uh, I put my weight on more than I wanted to. So I said, okay, I'm going to start now. And uh, I've actually dropped about 15 pounds already. And, and for me, dropping weight is, is really easy. I used to be this big, giant, fat guy uh, who was running 30 miles a week and going to the gym every, every day for an hour. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that's another story. Could you sort of define yourself in the marketplace of current health thought? Like when people say, oh, Dr. Stephen Gundry, he's a which 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 guy is he is he he's a this guy or a that guy like like where would you say is your camp set up in the health universe right now uh i'm hopefully one of the foremost disruptors in health thinking currently okay How's love that? it love it because i'm trying to be a foremost disruptor in educational thinking right now so uh let's have a disruptive conversation here um, and, and what do you think are the, 
the fallacies or the paradigms, if you will, that are begging for someone like you to, to disrupt right now? Well, so much of, um, let's take nutritional advice, um, is uh, based on falsehoods that have existed for over a hundred years. And they just get, keep being repeated and repeated without uh, looking at current available evidence. So let me just give you one example, which you know, ties into the current book, The Energy Paradox. There are a number of noted authors who are MDs, who have actually never laid hand on a patient, have never practiced medicine, and have spouted their party line for 30 years without ever changing any recommendation of what they said. Now, 30 years is a long time in medicine and nutrition. Uh, I'm one of the few um, authors, nutritionists who have a medical practice. I see patients, believe it or not, six days a week, even Saturdays and Sunday. Hmm. And that shocks most people because uh, some of my compatriots who are very famous say, what are you doing seeing patients? Uh, well, how stupid, you, know, you get better things to do. Well, it's called the practice of medicine because believe it or not, you practice and you learn from your patients. And I've dedicated a number of my books to my patients because they've taught me things. So getting back to the subject, for instance, the human microbiome wasn't even known about until about 12 years ago. We had no idea that there were a hundred trillion bugs, bacteria, fungi living inside of our gut. And we just thought our intestines were some kind of hollow tube that we processed food through and whatever we didn't eat mm. came, out, came out the rear end. We now know, and the energy paradox is really all about that, that this community of bacteria probably affects everything that's ever gonna happen to us. Uh, we know that it affects our emotions, the way we think it affects any disease process that's going to happen to us. And yet there are still people who are, act as if this knowledge isn't important and just continue to say the same thing. Uh, a good friend of mine, David Perlmutter, who wrote Brain Brain, last year came out with the fifth year anniversary edition of Grain Brain. And about, I don't know, 30 or 40% of it was new because when he wrote that book, uh, the human microbiome was just being, uh, beginning to understood. And he says, holy cow, you know, I had to rewrite, you know, half the book based on what we now know about, you know, the microbiome. And he and I reminisce, I said, yeah, you know, it's amazing. Um, I came at this as a heart surgeon and now realize that the reason heart disease exists is because of what happens in our gut. And you came at this from a brain neurologist standpoint, and you now know that most of what happens in the brain is because of the gut. And I said, you know, we both go, Hippocrates was right. All disease begins in the gut. So um, and that just gives you an example. If you, mm -hmm. if, you, if you don't learn and then don't tell people that what you said, like what I said in my first book 16 years ago, uh, a lot of that doesn't apply anymore because I, you know, I went, oh my gosh, you know, I didn't, you know, I guess I didn't know that when I wrote that book. And now I know that. So I'm going to say, uh, I made a mistake. Uh, I've learned something new that changed my mind. In fact, I was on a podcast yesterday and the host said, you know, you're one of those guys who says, I changed my mind. I learned something new. I don't, you know, this is not true. And they said, that's so rare uh, that someone would actually say, hey, I learned something. Hmm. You know, I, uh, I, it, I, I'm so glad we're talking about the microbiome. I've been, I've been loosely obsessed with the microbiome for about a year um, since I met a guy who's a, who's a research scientist, and he basically told me that the microbiome, I can't remember if he, it was, I think he basically called it the third frontier. He said, you know, there's really only 
th three places that are as yet woefully underexplored. There's the nether regions of space, which have some particular logistical difficulty. Sure. There's the bottom of the ocean, which has some other logistical difficulties. And there's the microbiome. There's, there's the underlayer of what's really going on in the human body that we've basically missed for most of the history of medicine. And we're only now realizing it. And he's a, he's a microbiome research scientist. And he got me really, he really, he kind of had me sold on like, you know, space is not the final frontier, but quite the contrary, it's literally in your gut. And I've been, I've been really um, trying to learn as much as I can. Um, but maybe for those, like I would, if, 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 if you're a 10 and let's say somebody who's never even heard of microbiome is a one, I would say I'm probably like a six in terms of like, I, I'm pretty into it. But, but help the person who's maybe like a one, a two, or a three, and just is, this is new to them, like microbiome, I've heard of it, I don't really know why it matters or why it's important. Can you give it some context in terms of like the, the gravitas of what we're talking about here? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I had uh, you know, the former FDA commissioner, uh, David Kessler on my podcast, Dr. Gundry podcast last year. And he and I were reminiscing that when he and I were in medical school, we literally thought the gut was a, a hollow tube where you had some enzymes that broke down carbohydrates and proteins and fats and you absorb them. And then what was left over was pooped out and that was about it. And he said, you know, we had no idea that probably the most important part of us was in there as basically a tropical rainforest that we now know controls almost everything that happens to us. And so let me, and this is all in the energy paradox. So most people by now have heard of probiotics. Those are, let's call them friendly bacteria. You know, they're in yogurts and kombucha and sauerkraut and they're important. But we're now beginning to realize that these probiotics, these friendly bacteria, have specific tastes and wants in terms of the food they want to eat to sustain them. And we're beginning to understand that those particular foods are vitally important to feed these guys because of what these guys are going to do for us. So those are called prebiotics. And so prebiotics in general are fiber. Now, there's a lot of different kinds of fiber and most of the fiber that people think is what they should be eating is completely wrong. Uh, but fiber is eaten by the probiotics. Now, what's really exciting, and this is the frontier of the microbiome, is that these bacteria actually produce a language a communication system that they communicate to our brain, they communicate to our mitochondria, which are the energy producing organelles in all of our cells. And these are called postbiotics. So, and it gets really confusing. Okay, so you got probiotics, the friendly bugs, you got prebiotics, the fiber that feeds the friendly bugs. And when the friendly bugs eat what they want to eat, they produce postbiotics. That is literally a language, a true language of communication. And we, we conjecture that this existed. We said, eh, there's, there's text messages going back and forth mm -hmm. between the microbiome and us. We, we just know they're there. We've never, you know, they're there, but we don't know what it is. Well, when this was discovered, when postbiotics, this language was discovered, it, it, to me, it was like breaking the Enigma code in World War II, the German mm -hmm. code. And you know, once we understood that code, you know, then you knew where the German bombers were heading, what, what the heck, and it really saved Britain. So we now understand the language that this five pounds of crap sitting in our in our gut is actually in control 
of most everything that happens to us. And the point of the book is, I can absolutely guarantee you that they're in control of our energy levels, uh, but it's far beyond that. Um, so you're right, this is, what we now know is that Hippocrates somehow 2,500 years ago was right, that all disease begins in the gut. And I've paraphrased Hippocrates to say, all disease begins in a leaky gut. And we can get into that if you want, because that, it turns out, is, is the ultimate final frontier. Yeah, I, I very much would like to get into that. And I'll share that the way, um, the way my friend, who's a research scientist, explained it to me, he, I remember you, you prompted me to remember, he called it the, the micro, uh, the micro the, he basically said, you have a microbial internet inside your body that has 100 trillion little nodes the way the internet might have 20 million servers or you know you think of like bitcoin for example having you know millions of servers all over the world that are decentralized and that are you know calculating algorithms and feeding back into the central repository and database that that's literally what all these microbes are doing in your body and that and then a lot of his research is centered around how to get them to turn back on because a lot of us we essentially we flip the off switches. It's like if you went around on the cellular network and turned off like 90% of the antenna in the world and nobody would have any cell service that by eating, ingesting toxins and processed foods and sh yep. refined sugars and stuff, we've kind of, we've deadened so, ma so many of these, these receptors that we're not, we're like, we're all operating on like the equivalent of fumes in our, in our microbial telecommunications network. Um, so anyway, that's, does that does that comport with what you're describing the way I just explained it? Yeah, um, I mean, I think another way to think about this teeming mass of organism, single cell organism, is a tropical rainforest, and yeah. a tropical rainforest may have, you know, ten thousand different species of animals mm -hmm. and plants that are really actually all interdependent on each other. And what we essentially do with our diet is we just drop napalm on this tropical rainforest. Another way to look at it is it's now a coral reef that used to be this thriving community. And now we've got bleached coral all over the world and the Great Barrier Reef is, is dying. And it's no wonder that all these other communities of animals and plants and insects can't thrive without that basic biomass of you know interconnection yeah so what are, so what are some of the the bodily systems you know or, or maybe not bodily systems but pragmatically in the course of a day-to-day -day life i go through a lot like i wake up and i need energy to get out of bed right so energy that's one system that my biome is is intertwined with what are the different ways in very like layman sort of prosaic terms that my biome is affecting me daily in my life. You said, you mentioned emotions, you mentioned energy. What other impacts does it have? Well, your, your microbiome um, literally controls how much energy, ATP, you will produce uh, during the day. We now know that if this microbiome is thriving, they literally tell your mitochondria, these little energy producing organelles, uh, how much energy to produce. They basically say, hey, things are great down here in the engine room. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're firing on all cylinders. We don't see any problems. Uh, go ahead, process you know, food into energy and we got your back. If instead you've got a decimated microbiome or even worse, if you have a microbiome that the good guys have been replaced by gang members, uh, the gang members are busy down there, you know, throwing rocks through windows, um, burning tires in the street. And like in the energy paradox, all of your cops, your armies are down in your gut fighting, you know, a bunch of gang members where in this signal, gets transmitted to your 
uh, mitochondria that go, whoa, you know, there's big trouble down below and we need to cut back on energy production because we actually need to support, support our troops down in our gut until, you know, things are better. And we see this all the time with this epidemic of low energy right now. And mm -hmm. People are eating plenty. I mean, this is not a low energy problem because we don't have enough to eat. Uh, that might right. have happened long ago, but that's not our problem. But people are exhausted. Um, they, and Pete is attributed to, oh, okay, you know, Jeff, you're, you're a busy entrepreneur. You've got 12 businesses simultaneously running. You're, you're doing a podcast. You got two kids. Uh, no wonder you're exhausted. Well, apparently nobody told that to primitive hunter gatherers right. um, like the Hadzas. And I, if we get to it, I, I love this story from the book about comparing the energy production by a Hadza, this tribe in Tanzania, to desk workers. And uh, anyhow, nobody ever talked about being tired or lack of energy. In fact, some of these cultures have no word for being tired. Hey, sorry for the interruption. I just wanted to let you know you can get a free copy of my book, The Millionaire Shortcut, which shows you the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new economy. And there's a special link just for this episode in the description. So thanks for tuning in and I hope you enjoy the rest of the episode. I mentioned to you, I had Dave Asprey on the show and he tells a similar story. He was yeah. 300 pounds working out two, three hours a day going to doctors and they just were like, no, you're lying. You must secretly yeah. be binge eating ice cream all night. Uh, why don't you talk about that? Like how, what, what is, I mean, that seems like its own paradox. You've got a lot, I think it's a common story. People that don't understand why they're, they're working so hard in the gym and the weight doesn't come off. Yeah, a lot of it has to do, and again, this is in the energy paradox. The vast majority of Americans are metabolically inflexible. Another word for it is insulin resistant. Another word for it is pre-diabetic. And quite frankly, the average doctor doesn't even know that we should be measuring a fasting insulin level as maybe the best predictor of bad things happening to us or good things happening to us. And uh, like I talk about in, in the upcoming, upcoming book, uh, Unlocking the Keto Code, 88% of Americans are metabolically inflexible. 88% of us. 95% of overweight people are metabolically infle inflexible. And 99.5% of obese individuals are metabolically inflexible. And let me explain that in simple terms. Normally, it, normally our mitochondria use primarily sugar to produce energy. They, they use glucose. Our brain is pretty much dependent on using sugar for energy. But if you stop eating, there better be a backup system because our sugar supplies run out in about eight to 12 hours. So we have to shift to a different fuel. And luckily, if your mitochondria work properly, you can literally automatically switch to burning free fatty acids, fat as a fuel, because quite frankly, we have plenty. Even very skinny people, believe it or not, have a lot of fat stores. Um, they just don't see it. So it's kind of like a hybrid car. Um, you run on gasoline and then, okay, the gasoline runs out and you're charging the battery while you're running on gasoline. The gasoline runs out, you switch over to electric. The electric runs out, switch over to gas. So we can instantaneously switch to fuel, from fuels. Most Americans, in fact, most people in the world now, no longer have the ability to go access the fat that is stored in them because long story short, this hormone called insulin is the fat storage hormone. And when insulin's elevated, insulin won't let any of us near the fat. And so we could stop eating, but insulin remains high for several days and it can't let the fat out of our cells. And that's why most people 
who try fasting or even a ketogenic diet, for instance, fall flat on their face. They get a headache, they're, they're out of energy. I couldn't go to the gym today because I'm out of energy. Well, it's true because you lost the ability to tap in to that battery pack, if you will, because of metabolic inflexibility. And let me tell you how sad this is. I have third year uh, family practice residents rotate through my institute. And these people who are about to go, you know, out into the world as practicing physicians and set up their own practice. And not one of them has ever been told that they ought to measure a fasting insulin level. And when they see that all the tests they've been told to measure, like a glucose, a fasting glucose, or even a hemoglobin A1C, which is two months of how you're handling sugars and proteins, they have no idea that a person could have a normal blood sugar, could have non-pre-diabetic hemoglobin A1C, but they can have a huge elevated fasting insulin level. And they go, holy cow, I, you know, I, how, I didn't know that. And why is that important? Because insulin is the fat storage hormone. So there I was, there Dave was, doing all this exercise, eating a healthy, low-fat, fairly high-carbohydrate diet, both Dave and I, and just packing on the pounds. And when I measured my insulin level for the first time 25 years ago, you know, I had an elevated insulin level. And I'm going, well, what the heck? No wonder I couldn't lose any weight. You know, I'm a, I'm a gorilla in the middle of summer, and I'm storing fat for the winter, no matter what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And that's when the switch went off for me. So I'm going to jump to the conclusion that the reason that medical schools aren't teaching what sounds like no brainer stuff to teach is because maybe there's no money in actually teaching people how to cure their own diseases and not get sick in the first place. Bingo. Okay. Uh, sickness is good for business. Yeah. Yeah. Um, un unfortunately. And, and we've been, we've been taught that, uh, you know, the pharmaceutical industry teaches medical students, uh, quite frankly, the pharmaceutical industry funds uh, medical schools, big agriculture funds medical schools. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's this, you know, kind of holy alliance or unholy alliance between big pharma, big agriculture and big medicine. And they're all three are dependent on each other. And, and that's what we as doctors get fed. Yeah. Unfortunately. So, so what then it, I, I mean, clearly you're not, uh, I forget what term you applied to yourself. Some sort of like big gorilla or you're not, <laughs> yeah, you're a, not big a big fat guy. No, well, gorillas, believe it or not, gorillas, great apes only have 4% body mass. And I mean, you think about that, um, you know, bodybuilders compete at about 7% right. body fat. And so, yeah, I mean, we're the fat eight. Uh, we have, <laughs> we are, we are we're, yeah. that, that's our correct name. We're the fat eight. <laughs> so how do you, you know, somebody's metabolically resistant or insulin resistant, um, clearly there's a way to reverse that. Correct. And I, I assume that's your books yeah. cover that. Is there, a, is there a synopsis or a praises you can give? At sure. least, a, or even a hint? Yeah, well, number, number one, uh, we are fed a steady diet of ultra refined carbohydrates. And the more we process, well, I'll, I'll just take wheat as an example. Um, the more we process wheat into a fine white powder, uh, it acts like any other fine white powder and all, all addictive substances are fine white powders. Um, <laughs> But uh, again, Don Kessler, the FDA commissioner, tells a fascinating story. He actually was in charge of the nutrition facts label on the back of a package. Mm -hmm. And he came up with this label and he walked into, I won't even mention the president, the office, and there was big agriculture and big agriculture representatives and said, you can't put this label, uh, you can't make us put this label on our packages. And he said, well, why not? And he said, because people will see all that sugar 
and they won't buy our products. And he said, but yeah, but the, you know, the, your products have all that sugar. And they said, well, no, you're gonna change the label. And, he, and so they negotiate. And so if, if there was a simple sugar, a single molecule sugar, you had to put it on the label of sugar. But if you had two molecules of sugar bound together with a chemical bond, you didn't have to list it as sugar, you had to put it as carbohydrates. And so, yeah, so he uses the example of a bagel and a bagel has about 300 calories. And if you look on the back, you will see zero sugar on most bagel labels, but you'll see about, oh, 40 grams of carbohydrates. And you'll see usually zero fiber. And right. the fun thing is there are four grams of carbohydrates in a teaspoon of sugar. So you do the math, there are 10 teaspoons of sugar in that zero sugar bagel on the label. And so, and that, that sugar that in that finely ground up wheat is mobilized into sugar faster than if you ate table sugar. And he said, that's what we have sold the American people into thinking that their healthy food, which has zero sugar or two grams of sugar um, is healthy for them. And it's all hiding under total carbohydrates. And they can label that as a low sugar or sugar Absolutely. free food. Absolutely. So it's not just a sin of omission. I mean, they're actually telling you this is sugar free. Correct, completely legally. Yeah, yeah, wow. Okay, I, so, yeah, so, I, I, so, so, this, so is essentially, this this insulin resistance you're saying is basically reversible if you just stop eating the crap that caused it in the first place. Basically, that, that's exactly right. Simplistically, if we get that, it's not like we're all past the point of no return and we can't. There's no salvation. No, I, I used to joke long ago when I started my institute that you know a, a grizzly bear doesn't eat for five months and a grizzly bear leaves the den with their muscle mass intact. They don't touch their muscle. Why? Because they touch their muscle, they couldn't hunt and they starved to death right. and they got out. But a grizzly bear loses all that fat. And fascinatingly, it turns out that a grizzly bear or any bear stores fat for the winter by becoming insulin resistant because as their insulin goes up, you everything you eat turns into fat, even those salmon. And so, the key I used to tell people is, look, I'm just going to lock you in a cave for five months and you'll do great. In fact, the longest supervised fast was 381 days and the guy didn't die. Um, but, but as I mentioned, no one would come and see me to you know, be locked in a cave for five months. Right. But the principle is correct. If we can get rid of these modern foods and act like our grandparents. Um, in fact, just look at any old picture from, yeah. from the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Everybody was skinny. I, I tell people to watch an old Alfred Hitchcock movie, which is really kind of fun. Alfred Hitchcock is, uh, is in, has a cameo in every one of his uh, movies. And Alfred Hitchcock had this image of this big giant fat guy, a rotund right. individual. And my favorite example is uh, North by Northwest. And the first scene, Alfred, the sky, a, moderate, uh, a moderately overweight guy gets out of a taxi in front of Grand Central Station. And he just looks a little overweight. And it's Alfred Hitchcock. But he's portrayed as this huge obese individual. But then you look at the rest of the movie, everyone is stick thin. Even the tourists at Mount Rushmore are stick thin. And if we looked at the tourists at Mount Rushmore today, you know, we're, we're, the, we're all the mm -hmm. Pillsbury Doughboy. Yeah, I, I remember uh, watching, a, I don't know, it was a Cecil B. DeMille movie. I don't remember if it was, I think it was 10 Commandments or something. And, and reading about how they just would, they would just do these open casting calls that was just like, hey, we need, we need 2000 extras for a scene at the Coliseum. So just come on, bring your friends, right? Right. So it was a pretty general cross section of society and you watch the movie and it's like, oh, there's like a thousand skinny people as extras. Whereas we all know if you, if you did an open call for a thousand <laughs> extras today, 
Hollywood would be filtering out going, we want that guy and skip you, skip you, skip you, skip you, skip you. And that guy, cause we don't want a bunch of fat people in our movie. Yeah. And it, it didn't used to be that way. It's, it's really, it's really interesting. So, um, Man, uh, okay, I want to I want to really really uh, utilize our time that we have left. I don't, you know, I want to try to keep this. I don't know how much time you have, but I want to get as much in as I can. So you said something earlier that I want to come back to. You mentioned leaky gut, and why, rather than me, t- I was going to say, well, I think it means this. Why don't you just tell me what it means? I, I have a, I think I, I think I know what it means, but I'd rather t- hear it from a guy who knows he knows. Okay. So uh, if you had asked me what I thought about leaky gut maybe 18 years ago, I probably would have laughed out of the room and said, hey, it's pseudoscience. It's not. Or you would have said it's diarrhea. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah. So it's not pseudoscience. Uh, it turns out the lining of our gut is the same surface area as a tennis court inside of you and me. In, in, there's a tennis court in there. We have if, and, if and our gut meaning our does that start the, in our esophagus? Yeah, from the from esophagus, your mouth all the way stomach, down to your rear end. Duodenum. Yep. Yep. Into small, small intestine, intestine colon. Intestine. Yep. The yep. whole bit. So that that whole area is is the surface area of a tennis court, and it's basically uh, our skin turned inside out, and that wall is actually only one cell thick, and one cell thick. Wow. Uh, now, because it's only one cell thick, these cells are held together. Um, you might be old enough to remember Red Rover, Red Rover, uh, send Sally right over. Right. The two lines of kids and they all locked arms and you tried to break through. So these, these cells are locked arms and with what are called tight junctions and there won't be a test. Long story short, lectins, one of my favorite subjects and we won't go there today and other things can actually attach to the wall of the gut and flip a switch and break the tight junction. So now there's actually a gap in the wall of our gut. Now here's what's fun. 80% of all of our white blood cells, our immune system are on the other side of this wall. They're literally our border patrol. Why? Because bad things can come across. Bacteria can come across, pieces of food can come across, lectins can come across. And what we found with autoimmune disease, for instance, is that 100% of my patients who present with autoimmune disease have leaky gut. 100% of patients with depression have leaky gut. 100% of people with dementia have leaky gut. 100% of people with coronary artery disease have leaky gut. And that's why Hippocrates was right, but the paraphrase of Hippocrates, all disease begins in leaky gut. And the exciting news is, and this is what I do in my clinics, when you seal leaky gut, and that's what we do with all of our programs, and that's what we do in the books, the disease goes away. We have a 94% remission rate in any autoimmune disease by simply teaching people how to seal their gut. So, okay, a lot of, lot of, a lot of really powerful stuff you just shared. First of all, you, you mentioned lectins. You said, I don't want to go there. It's complex or it t- takes a lot of time. But if I, can, if I can briefly summarize and tell me if I'm right, as I understand, lectins you talked about in the plant paradox. Correct. And they're basically proteins that are contained in, in certain plants. Correct. That are toxic to the body. Correct. They're the defense system of the plant against being eaten. Yeah, which makes sense because if, if, you, if you go through life stuck in, in the ground, unable to move and unable to defend yourself with fists or teeth or anything, how do you keep yourself from getting eaten? Correct. You have to create toxicity in your own body so that an animal won't want to eat you right that's exactly right and okay most animals are really smart when they eat something that interferes with their movement that interferes with their reproduction that interferes with this starts pain the animal goes i'm not gonna eat that again you know that i'm not that dumb are, are lectins the number one cause of leaky gut so there are multiple causes now. Lectins are way up there. I think one of the really awful things that's happened to us is Roundup, glyphosate. 
So Roundup is now sprayed on everything. Uh, Roundup is in our wine. Uh, Roundup is in all of our oat products, all of our grain products. All, most of our soybeans are sprayed with Roundup. Our corn is sprayed with Roundup. And not just GMO anymore. People associate with Roundup with GMO. It's sprayed on conventional crops. Hmm. And the problem with Roundup is that it, all by itself, no matter what, can cause leaky gut. And so it's one of the insidious things, and you don't have to put Roundup on a label. Um, it's one of these insidious things that slowly but surely, because Roundup use is now used on conventional crops for harvesting, it's everywhere in us. And yeah, Roundups, and I talk about this in the energy paradox, uh, another problem with, that we never had before. Yeah. So is, is the, is, what is the, real quick, what is the plant paradox? Is it this idea that, of the poisons? Yeah, certain foods uh, were not designed to eat. No human being ate a grain or a bean, which are loaded with lectins until 10,000 years ago. And the amazing thing is, uh, all of us, for the most part, are from Europe, Asia, or Africa. And until 500 years ago, none of us were exposed to a plant from the Americas. Nobody had corn, nobody had quinoa, nobody had tomatoes, nobody had potatoes, nobody had eggplant, nobody had uh, peppers, because these are all American plants, and they're loaded with lectins. So really? in, in just really a few generations, we've been exposed to huge numbers of plants that we really have no evolutionary history eating. Huh. And that's what the book goes through. Now, you can detoxify most lectins. You can use a pressure cooker. And one of my books, The Plant Paradox Family Cookbook, is a pressure cooker a book on how to detoxify lectins. But if I remember, some plants can't be detoxified with, with cooking, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, uh, gluten cannot be broken uh, with a pressure cooker. Oats the same way. Uh, those uh, rye, barley, th those are good. Okay. Yeah, you can't, you can't do it, unfortunately. So, okay, so let's let's follow this leaky gut thread real quick. So you've got, you know, what are supposed to be impermeable or semi permeable membrane that lines the gut, and now there's a tear, so to speak. Yeah, and, and whatever can get through. Uh, and you're, I mean, and, and I caught when you said, I mean, you said you in statistics, the difference between 100% and 99.9% is everything, right? And you said 100%. Now, are you saying 100%? I mean, do you, do you go so far as to, to say that it's causation or just correlation between leaky gut and depression, leaky gut and dementia, leaky gut and, and whatever? So we've been, we've been convinced that there is strong correlation. And, but with every passing year, uh, I'm now convinced that it is causation. Uh, and again- uh, Is that controversial? How, like, do, do other doctors argue and fight it, about that? It is becoming less controversial. Um, there are multiple theories, for instance, of heart disease. You know, and I'm a heart surgeon and a cardiologist. The cholesterol theory of heart disease is just one theory. But if you, for instance, lectins, these proteins, if they get through the wall of your gut, love to stick to the surface of your blood vessels. And they create an irritation, inflammation. And your white blood cells come and attack it, and it gets a red sore spot. And cholesterol sits there and patches it just like patching a pothole and if you add more irritation more cholesterol patches it and eventually you get a pretty big patch if you take away the source of that irritation then you no longer need that patch and the patch goes away. It's like, you know, I, I wear an aura ring and, you know, I do weights and I have calluses on either side of my aura ring. That's a protective area mm -hmm. uh, to stop hurting myself. If I either stop wearing my aura ring or stop lifting weights, I got news for you. Those calluses would go away, as anyone knows. So it's the same principle. So if lectins 
are not entering my bloodstream, then they have no way of getting to attach to my blood vessel. And, and this is what I learned from Big Ed 25 years ago, more than that now, who reversed his inoperable coronary artery disease by changing his diet and taking a bunch of supplements from a health food store. And it was the and most you amazing. I heard you mention Big Ed on interviews. This was kind of your original, was he your inspiration? That was my was he your mentor or what? No, that was my epiphany. This was a 48 year old guy from Miami who. Okay. Um, this was, was a patient? A, oh, yeah, the patient. Okay. And he, he went around the country. He was told he had inoperable coronary artery disease. His, his blood vessels were so clogged up that you couldn't put stents in them. You couldn't do bypasses because there wasn't any place to put the bypass. And these guys go around the country looking for some idiot like me to operate on. Them. And he went to all the usual places and I won't name them. And everybody turned him down for good reason. And uh, he got to me about six months into his journey. And I looked at his movie, his angiogram, and I said, you know, I don't turn many people down, but everybody's right. You know, I, I can't help you. I'm sorry. And he said, well, look, uh, I've been on a diet for the last six months and I've lost 45 pounds. Now he weighed 265 when I met him. And he said, I've gone to a health food store and I'm, I'm taking all these supplements. He literally had this huge shopping bag of supplements. He said, you know, maybe I did something in here with my heart. And I go, well, you know, good for you, losing weight, that's not going to do anything. And I know what you did with those supplements, you made expensive urine, uh, which I really believe back then. And he said, oh, come on, you know, I'm, I've come all the way, why don't we get a new angiogram, a new movie of my heart? And I said, ah, okay. This guy in six months time cleaned out 50% of all the blockages in his heart in six months. And I went, well, that's impossible. And I went, well, wait a minute. I'm sitting here looking at the old one and the new one. And all the guy did was change his diet and take some supplements. And so I started experimenting on myself and kind of the rest is history. I realized, you know, I shouldn't be cracking people open. I should be teaching them how to eat to avoid me. And mm -hmm. that's what I did all. And that was a really stupid thing for a heart surgeon to do. Let me tell you, speaking, yeah. of, speaking of career change. Um, you know, even an academic heart surgeon can make a decent living, but teaching people how to eat, to mention an earlier point, nobody pays you to teach people how to eat. Yeah, that's really, I mean, that's, I feel like that's a whole other conversation for a whole other podcast is, is the, it's really an ethics question. You know, how, how do you, how do, and, and it's not just in medicine, frankly, in this world, um, I mean, it's in academia too. Like even even at the university. Well, whatever. I'm, I'm yeah. I'm suggesting it's a subject for another time. And now I'm I'm starting to slip into it. But like the ethical question of how do we discipline ourselves to do what is in the best interest of our customer, even if it's against our own self interest, every time without hesitation. Right. That we yeah. we solve that. We've we've really changed the world. Right. Um, That's true. That's true. Um, Okay, so so Dr. Gundry, I know that according to the time we were allotted, we are out. Do you have five more minutes or do you need to go? Let me look. Uh, they're not here yet, uh, my next patient. So uh, yeah, let's, let's go five minutes. Okay, five minutes, just so we can bring it to a nice close. And I'm so grateful. Thank you for this conversation. Oh, thank you. Um, so I, I'm, I will be remiss if I don't ask this. Um, I want to talk about keto real quick, if we could. I know that you have a new book coming out, Unlocking the Keto Code. Uh, from the little bit that I've heard, it sounds like it's not probably what most people think of as keto. Like it's not a, call it Instagram keto. Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about keto? I mean, that's, if there's one word you can drop on a group of people to get them to start arguing and bickering, it's probably about health, it's probably keto. Can you like deobfuscate keto for us? Is that is that asking too much to do in just a few minutes for us? Yeah, uh, most people don't know that the ketogenic diet had its origins in the 1930s for a way of treating seizure disorders in children, and uh, there were no drugs for seizures uh, back in those days. And it was initially noticed that children who were starving. Uh, with severe uh, seizure disorder, uh, their seizures pretty much went away. And then when you fed them, their seizures came right back. And some researchers at uh, the Mayo Clinic 
uh, said, well, gee, that's interesting. Uh, ketos, ketosis and ketone bodies have been known about for a very long time, since actually the 1880s. And they knew that during starvation, ketones were made. And so they put two to two together and said, gee, ketones seem to have some effect on stopping seizures. And so what if we basically only fed kids fats, their diet would be 80% fats. They'd only get 10% of their calories from carbohydrates and they only get 10% of their calories from protein. And let's see what happens. And remarkably about 50 to 60% of these children on these diets, their seizures uh, were basically beautifully controlled. Now it had some downsides because just think about it, getting a kid to eat an 80% fat diet is really difficult. And these kids actually had some stunted growth, which ought to put on red flags to right. anyone who is a keto fan. And so it fell out of favor, uh, but the, the kind of the, the message that ketones were somehow miraculous for stopping seizures, uh, and these kids, quite frankly, were quite skinny, uh, prompted people uh, particularly in the 60s and 70s, to research exactly what ketones did and what they didn't do. And uh, this, uh, actually, some former Nobel uh, laureates were really involved in learning about ketones. So when I was talking about ketones in the energy paradox, and I've written about ketogenic diets in all my books, and people are shocked that my ketogenic diet has a remarkable lot of complex carbohydrates and it still works beautifully. So when I was researching the energy paradox, I said, you know, I think I've gotten how ketones work completely wrong. Ketones are absolutely a horrible fuel. And the first thing that people should take away from this is I got news for you. Being in ketosis and ketones in general is a horrible way to produce energy. It's a horrible fuel. Your, your performance does not improve, it actually declines. And here's the last little teaser. Research in humans from the 1970s shows that at a full ketosis, at a full ketogenic diet, only 30% of your energy is produced from ketones. That's it, 30% of your energy. And Dave Asprey would tell you, even at full ketosis, the brain can only use 70, get 70% 70 of its fuel from ketones. It still has to have, has to have 30% of its fuel as glucose, as sugar. So, so much for the brilliant strategy of burning ketones as a fuel. So there is a there's right, a much, there's a right or better way to do it. Yeah. So ketones, ketones simplistically are signaling molecules. Okay. And the secret of unlocking the keto code is to learning that there are equally efficient ways to produce these signaling molecules rather than being on a ketogenic diet. And without, that's- Without just having to cut the fat off a ribeye and- Exactly, and exactly. Yep, okay. and, that, okay. and that's, that's the secret. That's how you unlock the code. So can I end with one final question that's gonna, I'm, I'm literally, I'm, I'm not even gonna do any follow-up research. Whatever you say is how I'm gonna live. No pressure. Optimal macronutrient ratio for the I, six hour eating window. I could care less. I mean, a gorilla, well, yeah. A gorilla, you know, eats leaves and he's got more muscle mass than you and I will ever have. A horse eats leaves and grass. He'll, he has more muscle mass than I ever have. All the largest animals on earth get all their nutrition from plants. They get all their protein from plants. They get all their fatty. So you, don't, so you don't think you need to, you don't think there's a certain number of grams of protein per pound of lean body mass to oh, gosh, maintain no. muscle or nope. you don't go down that road? I, I can tell you there are hunter gatherers never sit around and go, Ooh, my macros were out this, this week. I, I better, you know, change my macros next week. Right, and I can, right. I can assure you a gorilla doesn't think that way and seems to do just fine.
Fascinating. Well, I, um, I have some catch up reading to do. I read the, um, about half of the plant paradox sitting in a, in a bookstore. It, was it 10? I mean, is that book more than 10 years old? Cause no, I it's, like all, it was it, like, it's only four and a half years old. The plant paradox. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Time flies. 2017. It was April. back in my thirties. So, Oh, there you go. You know, that's my excuse. Well, um, I have, but I have some catch up reading to do. And when does unlocking the keto code come out? March 8th, 2022. Soon. Fantastic. And uh, energy paradox just came energy. out. Yeah. In April. Uh, yeah. It was six, in April. Eight months ago. So you've yeah. been really busy writing books. Oh yeah. I write, uh, I, I write about a book a year and there's, there's more on the way. I'm starting the next one very soon. Um, so, but yeah, the unlocking the keto code is going to be really fun. Uh, like, uh, people know me as a disruptor and boy, am I going to disrupt keto. If you loved that episode, then you're definitely going to love this one. Check it out. My belief has always been that entrepreneurs are the ones who need resilience the most, because if you're a pro athlete, like you play the game and you rested. If you're an athlete, like I played the game and there was another one and another one and another one. And I thought about it and I went to sleep and like, you're always able to do more and you want to do more. 